Unspoken Issues. Hey, everybody. Before we get you into the six issues of Nightmare, I did want to point out that I did six videos, one on each issue, on my YouTube channel. So if you go to the hashtag source material YouTube channel, should be able to find the playlist for all six issues of Nightmare, one through five and issue zero. And you can hear much of what is being relayed to you in this podcast, but in video form. So again, head to YouTube, just look up source material, maybe punch in Nightmare while you're at it, and you should be able to find the playlist, and you can start from episode one and check out the comic while I'm talking about each issue. So with that being said, let's get on with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Unspoken Issues podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Starcher, and we will just be doing a solo shot tonight for a comic that came out in 1995 called Nightmare, and that's spelled K-N-I-G-H-T-M-A-R-E. And this is an image comic that released March of 1995. There was an, a comic prior to this called Nightmare, spelled the same exact way from Antarctic Press. That Nightmare from Antarctic Press was more of a manga-style book. This is not the Antarctic Press Nightmare. We will be talking about Image Comics Nightmare today. So let me tell you a little bit about why this book first off. No one would put this book and say, oh man, have you ever read Nightmare? No one's going to say that. This kind of fell in with a lot of the anti-hero extreme comics that came out back in the 90s. But the book had this great look to it, especially our main character here, Nightmare. Definitely a cool looking aesthetic to Nightmare. The first cover's pretty cool. You got Nightmare and it's kind of outlined in this dark orange kind of going to light orange. First explosive issue on the front and then you've got our character Nightmare who has what looks to be a couple guns on his back carrying a staff and very much armored and reminiscent of what a knight would look like. Massive, massive shoulder pads and he's firing what looks to be like a pistol of some sort down to the right hand corner of the book so it has this blue light blue to dark blue feel along with the dark orange to light orange feel to it and it's kind of like there is a fire below nightmare as he's jumping towards it it's kind of reflecting off of his body uh turning the front of where he's jumping to orange which is pretty cool our creative team on this book uh let's talk about who drew this thing and that was marat michaels if you listen to Rob Liefeld's podcast, Rob Observations, you've probably heard his name mentioned quite a few times. Marat, from the very beginning, he was tied to Rob Liefeld. If you take a look at Grand Comics Database, has his first work uncredited, I believe, on X-Force number five through seven. I think he was credited with the inks, maybe, maybe some pencils. But anyway, that's right there with Rob Liefeld. He follows Liefeld over to Image, and he's Pencils Brigade uh, and some other Extreme Studio titles at that point in time, uh, to where when we reach 95, he's given the reins to this book, Nightmare. The way Nightmare looked, I mean, it you thought this was going to be a fun player in the Image universe. But what we're going to get here are six issues of pretty much a contained story. So let's talk about our writer here, our scripter. Mind you, I, I just want to go ahead and tell you here, as far as credits go. We already talked about the pencils. That's Marat Michaels. Inks by Al Vey. Colors by Donald Skinner. Color separations by Extreme Color. And a letter by Kurt Hathaway. That's going to be our first issue. And most of the issues that we go through in this series are going to have that same creative team there. Most of the books will say Story and Plot by Rob Liefeld. So Rob clearly may have been the genesis of this idea for Nightmare. But our scripter is a guy by the name of Robert Lauren Fleming. So he's scripting the comic. Fleming starts his career at DC Comics, doing proofreading at first, and then becomes a writer later. First story he published was String Out in House of Mystery, number 316 in May of 1983. Then he co-created a book called Thriller with artist Trevor Von Eden in 83. I think he went up to 
seven issues. I believe it was 12 issues, and he stopped at seven. But he did leave the title before it ended. And it's actually kind of highly regarded. Quite a few people I saw on Twitter really love that series. The other thing that you may recognize Robert Warren Fleming from is his work with Keith Giffen. As we record this, we're less than a week out from when Keith had passed away. So working with Keith Giffen, you may have heard of a character named Ambush Bug. DC character, a lot of people love Ambush Bug. He and Keith Giffen also produced the Eclipso the Darkness Within miniseries with artist Bart Sears. They also reunited for Ambush Bug Year None in 2008. Uh, There was an entry on the Mike's Amazing World of Comics. There was a bunch of them for November of 94 in a book called The Big Book of Urban Legends that DC had apparently published. The Amazon description, I'll read this to you. It says, This collection of strange and bizarre anecdotal tales drawn ostensibly from real life contains 200 stories that have circulated across metropolitan areas, all invariably sworn to be true. The poodle in the microwave, the mouse in the Coke bottle, the accidental cannibals are just a few of the legends presented in that book, illustrated by artists from DC Comics. There's also, in the Wikipedia, an entry about how he worked on the real Ghostbusters in 1986. I did want to point out some other titles that he had done. Um, There was a a title called Valor, which he did issues 1 through 8 and number 10 on that. But as far as Image Comics goes, he does a little bit of additional Image Comics work shortly after this. Legend of Supreme 1 through 3, Prophet Chapel Super Soldiers 1 and 2, and Blood Wolf Summer Special with Keith Giffen. And just as an aside, I'm currently working on a dedicated project to the Supreme comics. If I get it done great <laughs> at some point, I will be visiting those Supreme issues, I'm sure, at some point here. So let's go ahead and get into this first issue. Like I said, it was on shelves March of 1995, and I already gave you the creative team for this first issue, and I'll read the synopsis for this first issue here. In the dark and gritty streets of the city, where shadows thrive and corruption runs rampant. Let me stop real quick. I saw somebody had posted something about this being this taking place in New York City, but I don't recall. I, I do not recall them actually saying what city they live in. There's a lot of references that Nightmare makes that he is part of the city, and or that he is the city, but there's not ever a mention of what the actual city is, so at least that I can recall. In the dark and gritty streets of the city where shadows thrive and corruption runs rampant, a vigilante known as Nightmare emerges from the depths of despair to wage a one-man war against the criminal underworld. The story commences with a grand gala, a gathering of the city's most influential mafia kingpins. Two dominant figures, Don Carlo and Don Castor, find themselves making deals with the Pacino brothers, their new business partners. Little do they know that this night will become a nightmare they can't escape. Through a broken window, like a phantom descending from the heavens, comes Alec Knight, the masked avenger known as Nightmare, armed with a staff and a burning desire for vengeance. We learn that he lost his beloved son Jeff, and his wife now clings to life in a coma in the hospital. Nightmare's motivation goes beyond revenge. It's a quest for justice. During the Bedlam, we discover Nightmare's peculiar admiration for the classic novel Don Quixote. The tragic backstory deepens when we learn that he was once on the precipice of becoming a Don himself, immersed in the world he now hunts. So this is pretty interesting here, just to kind of break up, break in here a little bit. That is one of the common themes that's kind of that kind of goes through the book. Alec Knight and his reverence for Don Quixote and the misadventures that Don Quixote got into. The gangsters open fire, but their bullets prove futile against Nightmare's bulletproof armor. With astonishing prowess, Nightmare dismantles his foes, revealing a past connection with the very criminals he is battling. Amid the chaos, Army General McMahon, yeah, the army is at this, by the way. The army are guests of the Mafia Dons. Army General McMahon grabs a shotgun, but even his bullets can't penetrate Nightmare's armor. It's a grisly scene as Nightmare breaks the general's neck, revealing a merciless determination. Another general, Carter, pleads for his life with lies and offers of wealth, but Nightmare's sense of justice is unwavering. He picks up a gun and executes Carter, leaving no room for negotiation. Don Carlo and Don Castor, now mere moments from the end, face the ruthless swords 
of Nightmare. It's a brutal end to the Kingpins as Nightmare becomes the avenging angel of the night. Once the vigilante has departed, the authorities arrive to assess the gruesome scene. 52 bodies in total. Detective Murtaugh finds a witness who points to the lone man responsible, Nightmare. She insists that this is only the beginning. As the press hounds Detective Murtaugh for details, a persistent Mr. Tapp speculates on whether this is the start of a mob war. Back at a local gym, Nightmare meets with a man named Kane, who appears to be a mentor. Kane admonishes Nightmare for the mass execution, trying to make him understand the difference between vengeance and justice. Nightmare's internal monologue reflects upon his own life, drawing parallels to the tale of Don Quixote. He hopes for a better future, one where his wife will awaken, and he can remember his son without the pain of his tragic death. He seeks to make a man named Logan pay for what he has done to his family. Not out of vengeance, but out of honor. Meanwhile, the President of the United States is distressed over the military officers who perished during the gala, along with the mobsters. Don Carbone, another mafia kingpin, prepares for business with his hitman. We discover that this hitman is none other than Logan, a figure from Nightmare's past. Carbone orders Logan to uncover who is responsible for the bloodbath and eliminate them. The mob is about to unleash a storm of retribution. On a rooftop, Nightmare contemplates the tragedy of his family's demise, vowing to cover his face as a sign of responsibility. He speaks of being emotionless since the tragedy, a man on a mission with a singular purpose. In the darkest corners of the city, someone named Mr. Zing receives a report that American generals were using mafia money to acquire nuclear weapons. He instructs a Yakuza named Kirasu to find the perpetrator, extract information, and then deliver the final merciless judgment. This is just the beginning of Nightmare's epic quest for justice, a tale that blurs the lines between hero and anti-hero and leaves us hanging on the precipice of a dark and thrilling adventure. So there you go. That is issue one of Nightmare. Got a lot going on here. You've got a pretty simple premise with Nightmare somewhat being involved with the mob prior to this, now seeking to exact, he says, honor. But vengeance could also be a perfect word for it. Simple enough there. But then things get really kind of strange as we've got the army involved here with mobsters. And we also have a situation where there are nuclear weapons coming into play. We've got Don Carbone, uh, who is going to be a major player in this. Also, Logan. He's going to be a major player here in these upcoming issues. And Karasu. Karasu will play a big part in these later issues as well. Now, I will say couple spots that stick out to me here in the book. Nightmare is this great imposing figure. Blue suit, you know, massive shoulder pads. Uh, well, I can't even call them pads. It's shoulder armor because it looks like steel coming off of his shoulders. It's funny as he's hitting these mobsters. Hi, Joey. Long time no see, Sam. Now, this is all inner dialogue because he wants to keep his identity secret. How's the wife, Harry? And you, Vic, any more kids? <laughs> Yo, Pete, Dom, Lou, Sal, Vinny, all my old friends. Now, he is, kills them all. Like I said, 52 bodies. It's pretty crazy. All right, let's get into issue two. Uh, so it looks like really the only change here. Colors are being done by Byron Tolman. And inks, Alve is still doing the inks, but he's joined by Danny Meeky. But everything else stays the same. So issue two hit shelves May of 1995. This issue kicks off with Nightmare taking us on a journey through his tormented memories. He recalls the day his wife challenged him to break free from the clutches of the mob and stand up for what he believed in. It was a daring proposition, but Alec Knight knew that such a move would put his family in grave danger. Sadly, this premonition turned into a chilling reality as the Carbone family sent a group of ruthless men to annihilate Alec and his family. Led by Logan, the young up-and-comer Alec once took under his wing, in a tragedy that still haunts his every step, Alec's beloved son Jeff fell victim to the violence. His wife, however, clung to life in a seemingly endless coma. Alec fought valiantly, protecting his loved ones, but a bullet to the head from Logan left him for dead. Fate, it seems, had other plans for this relentless vigilante, as Alec miraculously recovered. Back in the present, the city's underworld is awash with treacherous undertakings. Don Carbone, a menacing figure, is preparing to acquire warheads from Ukraine, a chilling prospect that sets the stage for a global calamity. But lurking in Carbone's inner circle is a man who seems to have infiltrated his ranks, casting an ominous shadow over their dark dealings. 
In a heartbeat pounding twist, Nightmare steps into a gritty bar to interrogate some local thugs, Turk and Grotto, in pursuit of information about Carbone's impending meeting. This relentless avenger is never short of resolve, and he swiftly secures the crucial intel that will pave his way to a critical showdown. As the high-stakes meeting between the Russians and Don Carbone unfold in a cavernous warehouse, Nightmare makes his stealthy entrance. But here's where the plot thickens. Logan, the man from Alex's blood-soaked past, is also in attendance. The tension is palpable, the air heavy, with the promise of violence. As the nefarious deal kicks off, Nightmare makes his move, dispatching a hulking Russian enforcer with unparalleled skill and swiftness. The enigmatic Logan senses that something is amiss, setting the stage for an electrifying showdown. Simultaneously, Kurasu, who has been playing a covert role within Carbone's inner circle, unveils himself as the unthinkable occurs. With ruthless precision, he plunges a knife into Carbone's gut, an act that leaves the room seething with chaos and menace. To make matters worse, he arms one of the dreaded nuclear warheads, turning an already dire situation into a potential catastrophe of global proportions. Now, Nightmare must put aside his long-cherished plan for vengeance against Logan and turn his exceptional skills toward the harrowing task of disarming the nuclear weapon. In a race against time and enemies both known and mysterious, Nightmare's indomitable spirit is put to the ultimate test. So there you go. That's issue number two. Yeah, nuclear weapons, folks. <laughs> so as far as the second issue goes, again, we get a further look into the past. We get to see how Alex's family gets killed. Very Punisher-esque. You know, the mob has showed up and killed this man's whole family. And therefore, now this man is on a mission. But really, Alex's mission is or a lot more focused than Frank's mission. Frank's mission is to try and kill anybody that commits a crime. Nightmare's mission is to just end anyone that was involved with the killing of his family. The way that he, Logan steps in and has the gun to the back of his head and pulls the trigger, and somehow Alec Knight survives, which is pretty crazy. Alec had Logan at one point under his wing and was teaching him these ways, and there's a point, you know, he's thinking that Logan was always brash and never listened to him, and I've always told him, two to the head and one to the heart. But he never did that. He pulled the trigger and left. When Nightmare shows up and starts going up against the, you know, the mob and the Ukrainians, when he takes out the big like Zongief looking guy, his staff meets that guy right in the head. It's pretty gross. You know, it doesn't brain him or anything, but the staff comes right down around the top of his mohawk. The way that it's pictured is you could just see this blood splattering out from where the staff is. So he hit him pretty hard. There's a big two-page splash that, my goodness, Nightmare's just kind of standing on these crates. Uh, it looks great. It is funny that he wants to make sure that un people understand that his name starts with a K. <laughs> Get it? Nightmare? When he first meets up with this thug. And when you wake up, it's all going to seem like one big nightmare. That's with a K, as in Kremlin. <laughs> I will say, props to the colorist, color separations here. I'm just getting the reflections down off of Nightmare's, like, helmet and the rest of his suit looks really cool. And Kirasu arms the nuclear warhead and then leaves. Quite a bit of time left on that warhead, though. 99 minutes and 87 seconds. That's good. All right, let's get into our third issue here. Issue three on the shelf, July of 1995. This is a pretty cool cover. Murat's got Nightmare. He's kind of backed up against a wall. There's blood dripping down the wall. Nightmare's in all white at the top. The image logo is in this, like, shiny blue. Nightmare is just kind of standing there with a gun in his hand, crouched down, kind of looking at you menacingly, almost ready to attack. Every muscle and vein bulging. Typical 90s extreme comic book cover. One of the better covers out of the series, in my opinion. So, again, our creative team mostly stays the same. However, on inks, I'll just read and go through this. Danny Meeky, Alve, Jonathan Seibel, Jamie Mendoza, Joe Weems, Carl Allstetter on inks for issue three. Colors stay the same with Byron Tolman. Extreme color on the color separations and lettering Kurt Hathaway. As this issue begins, we find ourselves in the aftermath of a chilling act. Kurasu, the shadowy operative who had infiltrated Don Carbone's operation, has armed the nuclear warhead. 
Now he speeds off in a van, leaving a trail of uncertainty in his wake. Yeah, he left the bomb there, got into a van and left. Uh, Nightmare, with a steely resolve and a keen sense of justice, is left to piece together the enigma. It dawns on him that the confrontation he longed for with Logan will have to be postponed for the atomic bomb is a crisis that cannot be ignored. Now the thing is, is that there's a joke that he made in issue two that he had a disarming personality. I guess that's, I'm going to have to put that to the test now. So it makes you think that he's going to try and disarm the nuclear bomb. But during the turmoil, Nightmare stumbles upon the gravely injured Don Carbone, lying on the ground, barely clinging to life. Vengeance against his mortal enemy was within reach, but fate has other plans. Logan, the relentless nemesis, strikes from behind, setting the stage for an explosive showdown. As the two adversaries collide, Nightmare's rage boils over and he unveils a concealed blade from his staff, and in a heart-pounding twist, he slices off Logan's right arm, a chilling reminder of the history that binds them. Logan's instincts tangle with a sense of familiarity as if the masked avenger is someone he may have known in another lifetime. Just as the tension reaches its peak, Detective Murtaugh and the police descend upon the scene. It's a moment of reckoning, and it appears that the relentless vigilante has been cornered. That is, until he unleashes a rocket boost from his staff, launching him into the air and through the roof, escaping capture in a heart-stopping moment. With a narrow escape under his belt, Nightmare races to his motorcycle, a machine he affectionately named after Don Quixote's horse, Rosinante. The open road beckons, and he knows that his pursuit of justice is far from over. Inside, Don Carbone, on the brink of life and death, pleads with Murtaugh for assistance, reeling that he may be the only witness to the unfolding chaos. It's a desperate plea in the face of impending doom. Meanwhile, on an adjacent rooftop, Mr. Tapp and his companion, Manny, watch and hatch a sinister plan. They aim to expose Detective Murtaugh for keeping the truth about Nightmare's actions concealed from the public, labeling them a slaying spree. I'm going to stop right there real quick and talk about this Mr. Tapp. I think there were things that they wanted to do with this character and Detective Murtaugh that really never came to fruition. We kind of set that up a little bit here. As the clock relentlessly counts down, an officer shows Detective Murtaugh the armed nuclear bomb, and the stakes have never been higher. The city teeters on the edge of disaster, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Nightmare on his trusty superbike speeds down the road, following the trail of Kurasu's van. But when he catches up, he finds a shocking surprise. The back of the van is filled with ninjas, and a ferocious battle ensues. With a hint of humor that gives us a glimpse into his complex character, Alec Knight fights valiantly, but ultimately loses the battle, getting kicked off the van and back onto the unforgiving road. As the city's law enforcement grapples with the imminent crisis, the timer of the nuclear bomb ticks inexorably towards zero. All hope seems to be lost until an automated voice comes on, revealing the shocking twist. The bomb that was sold to the mafia was a fake. Karasu reports back to his mysterious boss, and the reader learns that the mastermind behind these sinister machinations is none other than Don Carbone's daughter, setting the stage for a gripping continuation of this dark and riveting tale. So there you go. That's issue three of Nightmare. I already talked about the cover. Love the cover to this. Like I said, I expected Nightmare. It seemed like he was going to be the one that was going to disarm the bomb. Didn't do so. <laughs> Didn't do that at all. Uh, it was the police that did that. There's two points in this issue where Alec tries to use his name, Nightmare, using it in dialogue, but working it in there as a substitute for the word Nightmare. The first time is when he's about to possibly kill Don Carbone and Logan attacks him from behind. Carbone's like, your voice, even muffled by that helmet, sounds vaguely familiar. Who are you? And Alec goes, I'm your worst night before he could get it out. Logan attacks him. And the second time that that happens, he just chopped Logan's arm off. Logan goes, hey, you're so familiar. It's like looking in a mirror. Who are you? It's very simple, Logan. I'm your worst knight. And then all of a sudden the cops show up. So that gag was pretty funny. Happened twice in the issue. Uh, again, the Don Quixote parallels here where, you know, he's named his bike after Don Quixote's horse. The super bike, by the way, is like, it's like this AI bike. So he can tell it to do things and it will. He jumps onto the van that's filled with the ninjas. He tells it to go home. He doesn't need it anymore, which ends up being a bad idea because he gets tossed off the van after trying to fight Karasu. But yeah, uh, Karasu's more than enough for Nightmare here. I mean, they fight for a little bit, but then Kurasu ends up slicing him 
across the gut and then kicking him off the van and he just hits the asphalt and he has to watch the truck drive away. Not a good showing for Nightmare there. And yeah, our big reveal with Don Carbone's daughter. I mean, my understanding is she's she was born and then Don Carbone went off into Japan or something like that. She kind of had to live life without a father and that's made her mad. She says... He left his sweet little daughter behind to grow up without a strong father figure in her life. The truth is, I've never forgiven him for it. Ugh. Oh, boy. Our fourth issue. Creative team pretty much stays the same here. Nothing changes in issue four. As the story kicks off, Alec Knight, recovering from his grueling battle with Karasu, finds himself in a moment of introspection. He reflects on the inspiration he drew from the pages of Don Quixote, a source of strength that once helped him rise above his weaknesses. However, after suffering a demoralizing defeat, he begins to question himself, wondering if his actions inadvertently led to the death of his family. It's a moment of vulnerability and doubt. Thankfully, Kane, his mentor, is there to steer Alec back onto the path of resolve and self-discovery. Alec realizes that he must rise again and continue his relentless fight against the darkness that threatens to consume the city. Meanwhile, on a yacht, the enigmatic Tina Carbone, Don Carbone's daughter convenes a secret meeting with Karasu and other shadowy figures. They plot to unleash something dark and malevolent, a malefic entity known as Thrill Kill. The origins of this entity are shrouded in mystery, hinting at a connection to Pandora's box. Thrill Kill exudes madness, obsessively muttering gruesome details about his insatiable appetite for violence. Don Carbone, recovering in a hospital and simmering with vengeance, plans to take retribution on Nightmare after they deal with Yakuza that tried to assassinate him. The mobster is poised to unleash a storm of revenge that could shake the city to its core. On the media front, Byron Tapp releases a newspaper article featuring a striking image of Nightmare soaring through the air, questioning Detective Murtaugh's role in the vigilante's escape. The public speculates whether the ongoing mayhem is part of a gang war, or if Nightmare is secretly collaborating with the police to eradicate mobsters. As Don Carbone is escorted from the hospital, a malevolent force descends upon the scene. Thrill Kill, wielding a deadly sword, makes quick work of Carbone's guards, poised to deliver a fatal blow to the ailing mob boss. Desperate pleas fall on deaf ears as Carbone attempts to negotiate for his life. But in a breathtaking turn of events, Nightmare intervenes, determined to thwart the malevolent entity's bloodlust. The two engage in a fierce battle, but Thrillkill's strength is matched only by its deranged babblings. An eerie moment unfolds as Thrillkill bites into Nightmare's neck, setting the stage for a deadly encounter. Just as it seems that Nightmare may become Thrillkill's next victim, Kane steps onto the scene, brandishing a weapon and firing a shot that strikes the malevolent entity in the back. The battle intensifies, as the shadows of the city converge in a confrontation that promises to test the limits of our hero's strength and resolve. So that is issue four of Nightmare, and yes, Thrillkill, this is a standout of this book in my opinion. Thrillkill is a really neat villain. Let me try to describe what Thrillkill looks like. Thrillkill has an outfit, I guess. I'm going to say it's black and white. It's kind of like down the middle in the mask. One half of the face of Thrillkill is black and the other half is white. Long purple mohawk for her hair. Very nimble. Very agile. A relentless bloodlust this thing has. The mutterings, I think, is what put it over the top for me. When Thrill Kill showed up, you know, as it's walking around, all it does is just talk about, like, when it kills people, it describes everything in detail. And some of the stuff it doesn't like, but, you know, I'd, I'd rather the eyeballs pop a certain way or something like that. It's just gross, but it's really cool. It's actually, as far as villains go, this is actually a unique villain that stands out amongst some of the other 90s villains that I recall. Its sole mission is to kill things. So Don Carbone's daughter was so mad that he was an absentee father. She sent this thing out to kill him. Tina Carbone, by the way, there were definitely some consistency errors in some of these characters. When I first read this and prepared to write something about it, one of the things that I pointed out was the hair color for Don Carbone seemed to change a lot. But Tina from issue three to issue four... In issue three, I mean, her hair color has changed. Almost her her whole appearance changed, in my opinion. She looks somewhat Asian. There's a side view of her. She looks like a an Italian brunette. <laughs> Probably one of the 
most glaring criticisms I can give this is that. And the consistency, first off, the style of the art so far, I have no problem with. It isn't some of the best that you can find out there in the 90s, I'm sure. But Marat is getting it across on the page, in my opinion. So uh, the whole Mr. Tap thing, getting his article out there, sowing doubt in the public on for the side of the law enforcement. Interesting. Uh, but I think that's going to be the last we see of Mr. Tap. And there is a great splash page. It's two panels divided right down the middle of the page. One half is Nightmare's face, and the other half is Thrill Kill's face as they're getting ready to face off. And you wrap the large intestine around your shoulders like a fire hose. It usually won't break apart, but watch out if it does. Nasty stuff is in the nose of the beholder. <laughs> it's, yeah. I like this character of Thrill Kill. Vicious. Uh, yeah, and Kane showing up at the end, fires a gun and puts a bullet right in the back of Thrill Kill, putting it down. But will it be down for good? As we get into Nightmare issue number five on the shelf, October of 1995. So we get a bit of a switch up here, although you wouldn't notice it very much in the art. Marat Michaels is not on this issue. It's penciled by John Fang. Inks are by Bruce Patterson. Colors by David Watts. Color separations in color. Creator and plotter Rob Liefeld. Script by Robert Lauren Fleming. So in issue five of Nightmare... Nightmare stands over Thrill Kill, believing that the malevolent entity has been defeated. But Kane, a seasoned figure who has encountered Thrill Kill before, knows better. He senses that the entity is far from down for the count, and the tension in the air is palpable. With Don Carbone lying in the shadows, Alec Knight and Kane turn their attention to the wounded mobster. But as they do, Thrill Kill rises once more, poised to deliver a final deadly blow to Kane. Nightmare, ever the relentless protector of justice, intervenes in the nick of time, putting his own life on the line. At this critical moment, Don Carbone learns the shocking truth about the vigilante who has haunted him for so long. Alec Knight reveals his true identity, and the revelation strikes like a thunderbolt. The battle intensifies, with Nightmare and Thrill Kill locked in a life-and-death struggle. Don Carbone, wounded and desperate, reaches for a gun, but Thrill Kill has other plans. The entity impales Carbone in the shoulder, a grim twist of fate for the once powerful mobster. As the fight rages on, Nightmare draws on his imposing staff, ejecting the blade and setting his sights on ending the malevolent entity once and for all. But Thrill Kill, unrelenting and seemingly invincible, charges with murderous intent. In a moment of desperation, Nightmare makes a daring move, slicing Thrill Kill's vocal cords. Although silenced, the entity's agitation only grows, setting the stage for a battle of immense proportions. In a breaking exchange, Thrill Kill swings at Nightmare, breaking his staff. It's a critical moment that leaves the vigilante at a loss, with seemingly no way to defeat an entity that heals with astonishing rapidity. But Alec Knight draws on a conversation with Kane, recalling a piece of advice about fighting fire with fire. He formulates a daring plan to burn Thrill Kill, putting an end to a nightmarish existence. As Thrill Kill leaps forward, Nightmare grabs a severed electrical wire, electrifying his armor. In a climactic moment of battle, Thrill Kill descends upon Nightmare, making contact with his helmet, instantly electrocuted, its life force extinguished, lying prone, and no longer a threat. Kane rushes to help Nightmare to his feet, and together they stand over the lifeless body of Thrill Kill. It's a poignant moment of triumph, as the relentless vigilante has finally vanquished his most impressive foe. So that is the end of issue five of Nightmare. Yeah, this battle between Thrill Kill and Nightmare is great. Kane has apparently dealt with this thing in the past, so he knows it's not dead. And of course, the moment they turn their backs on it, it gets up uh, and it goes after him. Well, there's a point where it looks like Kane is almost killed. And I love there. there's a splash page that was just it's like, hey, I've got this in my pocket. I've got to put this in a comic at some point. They got this great battle between these two. Thrill Kill is kind of jumping all over the place while Nightmare is swinging with these knives. This page has this great border around it. It looks fantastic. Don Carbone with a, some blonde hair now. The moment in this book is when Nightmare cuts Thrill Kill's vocal cords. So you're like, oh, he's done. Nightmare's open. He doesn't have to hear him anymore. <laughs> but... That doesn't stop him. That doesn't stop Thrill Kill from trying to talk <laughs> throughout the rest of the book. He's sitting there uh, just babbling incoherently. It's great. Yeah, there's a couple moments where Nightmare grabs a sword in this in these issues at the expense of his own hands. Like he cuts his hands up pretty good. 
Well, this is apparently happening outside of Extreme Studios. There's a, a big sign on top of this building that says Extreme Studios 95. But as Thrill Kill comes down with a sword, and it I don't know if it even touches Nightmare's armor, because the panel that you see is just the tip of the sword going right down. It's, it hasn't touched it yet, but there's an, a spark and an arc of electricity going up and hitting it. And then the next page is Thrill Kill being thrown back with electricity. So I gotta say, that was good fight. Probably one of the best issues of the series. And folks, that's it. Except for one more. We have a situation where we just read one through five. And the next issue we're about to talk about hit shelves right before issue five, which is interesting because the next one we're talking about should have been like an issue six. They threw it in there as issue zero. Now, it was on the shelves September 28th of 1995. This cover is one of those foil wraparound covers. But Marat Michaels and Alve on this cover. Anyway, it says Nightmare at the top. It's in black, outlined in orange. Nightmare with his staff on the front looking awesome. Uh, in the top left, I believe we've got Logan. It's kind of looking down there at him. All right, so the back is is kind of giving us a glimpse into... Alex passed, has him kind of kneeling on the ground, his wife's hand, you can see her, Logan's in the background, and Jeff laying there dead on the floor, and Alex screaming up in agony. But behind him is like this picture, the image of Connie in the hospital bed. And above that is what looks to be Don Carbone and Nightmare. You see both of their faces. Yeah, this cover is pretty crazy. Gives you an idea of what you're about to get into here. Creator and plot, Rob Liefeld. Script, Robert Lauren Fleming. So our script are never changed here. Pencils, Marat Michaels again. Inks, Alve, Danny Miki, Jonathan Seibel, Marlo Alquiza, and Jamie Mendoza. Colors, Laura Rode. Color separation, extreme color, and lettered by Kurt Hathaway. We're going to jump around a little bit here, so kind of bear with me. Our story unfurls in the past with a step back in time, revealing a pivotal moment in Alec Knight's life. We meet Salvador Garba, a ruthless mob enforcer tasked with delivering a brutal message to two associates, Logan and Alec Knight. Alec, known for his moral code, is visibly unsettled by the grim task at hand. Tensions flare, words turn to fists, and in a swift and resolute move, Alec silences Salvador with a kick between the legs. When we open this book, Sal has a guy by the throat and is teaching Alec and Logan about enforcing... Alec watches him drop a guy who was apparently skimming from the mob. So Alec doesn't really have a, you know, he's not too keen on enforcing as brutally as some others do in the mob. Now we fast forward to the present day where Nightmare, the masked vigilante, has a man named Vito in a stranglehold squeezing for information about a witness to the tragic hit on Alec Knight and his family. And this is a very similar situation that we had seen in the past where Alec has Vito by the throat, holding him stories up. Shockingly, the witness turns out to be none other than Connie, Alec's wife, who remains in a coma. Vito reveals that Logan, a haunting figure from the past, is now targeting her as the first step in his sinister plan. So yeah, Alec now knows that his wife is awake and plans to be a witness against the mob. Determined to protect Connie and bring justice to those who threaten his family, Nightmare summons his trusty computer-controlled bike, Rosinante, commanding it to transport him to the hospital where Connie lies vulnerable. Amongst the chaos and tension, Alec reminisces about the tumultuous relationship with Connie, strained by his dark involvement with the mob. He had once dreamed of leaving the criminal life behind to secure a safer future for his wife and their beloved son, Jeff. Back at the hospital, Logan, the cybernetically enhanced antagonist. Okay, yeah. Logan's still alive, got his arm cut off, but now he's got a cyber arm that he's using. Logan reaches Connie's room, only to find her absent from her bed. Yet Connie remains in the room, hidden from sight, while Logan narrows in on her trail. Just when hope seems to fade, Nightmare smashes through the hospital window, marking the beginning of a cataclysmic confrontation between the mass protector and his former ally, Logan. Logan, now aware of Nightmare's true identity as Alec Knight, confronts him about the dark and fateful day Alec turned against the family. Do another flashback here. The reader has shown Alec, who challenged the mighty Don Carbone at one point, expressing his vehement opposition to the mob's nefarious dealings with nuclear weapons. This flashback is showing kind of some of the events prior to issues one and two of Nightmare, where Alec apparently realizes that Don Carbone is going to make this deal 
for these nuclear weapons, and he's out. Alec firmly stated that he would not be a part of such a menacing venture. Now back to the present, the hospital room becomes a battleground as Logan and Nightmare engage in a fierce and visceral struggle. Logan, dripping with malevolence, taunts Alec by invoking the memory of his dearly departed son, Jeff. And as the fight intensifies, Alec seizes a crucial opportunity and incapacitates Logan with a devastating, electrified jolt from his bow staff. With Connie at his side, Nightmare prepares to make his escape, but she is bewildered, questioning why her beloved husband has donned the ominous guise of Nightmare. Before the duo can flee, Logan delivers a treacherous shot to Nightmare's back, Undeterred, Alec uses his oversized shoulder pads as a makeshift shield, setting the stage for a ferocious face-off. In the heat of the moment, Logan discloses his knowledge of Alec's involvement in Salvador's demise and vows to exact his vengeance. To kind of elaborate on that a little bit, Salvador had met his end at the hands of Alec, and now Logan feels a little upset about that, considering Salvador was the one who taught both of them. Alec, now fully embracing the mantle of Nightmare, unveils a deadly secret. A blade emerges from the top of his right hand, swift and unforgiving. In a single lethal stroke, he decapitates Logan, closing a grim chapter on their shared history. As Alec Knight departs the scene, he is ensnared by the cold embrace of the police, surrounded by the flashing lights of law enforcement. Unperturbed, he deploys blinding flares to disorient his pursuers and vanishes into the shadows, leaving Connie in the hands of the authorities. He solemnly resolves to watch over her from afar, his transformation into Nightmare now complete. So there you go. I understand why this is a zero issue. You know, we have a glimpse at Alex's origin and what preceded him becoming Nightmare, but it's just weird because we had a lot of that in the previous issue. So as to why this had to be an issue zero, I'm not absolutely 100% sure. I mean, it looks nice. Maybe that's why (laughs) they were just like, hey, we got to get an issue out here that looks good. How about issue six? And They're like, no, no, we can't do that. Are we telling a good bit of his origin? Yeah. All right, then let's let's make it a zero issue. There's a lot that happens here. We see what happens in the past. Plus, we get the resolution between him and Logan and we get to see his wife wake up, which is great. And there's, of course, more references to Don Quixote. I'll go ahead and read this part at the end. I may not be a true knight errant, but you'll always be my lady love. I'll live to serve and protect you. I'll dedicate my victories to you and call upon you in defeat. And from now on, I'm going to love you chastely from afar. Okay, let's get you some bonus content here. Uh, You know, going back and doing these video episodes, I realized a couple things. Number one, I wanted to point out, I kept calling them shoulder pads over and over, and it is not shoulder pads. They are large pieces of armor that go on his shoulders. Yeah, they're large pieces of armor. He's a knight, for crying out loud. So I think I might have mentioned that I I could not tell the city that this was set in. During, I think, like issue four, I realized that Mr. Tapp, his newspaper article was in the Chicago World paper. Yes, Chicago, folks. It all took place in Chicago, which made me wish for a little bit of a Savage Dragon crossover. That would have been nice. Alas, it was not to be. I did make mention of John Fang's art not being quite a noticeable change. And the more I have looked at it since recording that and since the review, I'm beginning to appreciate the differences between John Fang and Marat Michaels' rendition of Nightmare. I guess what I should have said is that the styles felt very similar. That's probably the best way that I could put it. I did want to mention how the fourth issue has a variant cover. It was done by Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti, where Nightmare stands amidst a bunch of destruction, like on this street. But if you look, you can see like at the top, there are some fingers coming down and it makes you start to think that this is part of another larger piece of art. And yes, it is. It is part of a nine issue series of covers that all go together with other extreme titles, Supreme Brigade, Glory, Youngblood, New Men, Chapel, Bloodstrike, and Prophet are all put together along with this nightmare issue to make this one large Extreme Studios image, which is pretty cool. So I'm not a well-read literary guy. I've read some books in my past, but I'm not going out for the classics such as Don Quixote. You know, in the 90s, I was reading comics. So... I knew a little bit about Don Quixote, and the best thing I could say is that Alec Knight, you can draw some parallels between Alec Knight and Don Quixote. Alec Knight is 
a little less crazy. Uh, but I did go to chat GPT to kind of help me here to draw some parallels between the two. So if you will allow me here, I'll read from what it came up with. Identity transformation. In both Nightmare and Don Quixote, the main characters transform identity. In Don Quixote, the protagonist, Alonzo Quijano, becomes the self-styled knight, Don Quixote, while in Nightmare, Alec Knight assumes the persona of the vigilante Nightmare. These transformations reflect a desire to escape their mundane lives and embrace a more heroic and idealistic existence. As far as mundane lives go for Alec Knight, things weren't very mundane for him as soon as his family got killed. So I'll disagree with chat GPT on that point, but I do easily see how both characters have changed their identity. Idealism versus reality. Don Quixote explores the stark contrast between Don Quixote's idealistic vision of the world as a place of chivalry and heroism and the harsh reality of the world he encounters. Similarly, Alec Knight and Nightmare grapples with his idealistic view of justice and the grim, often brutal, world of crime and corruption he confronts as a vigilante. Both characters face the challenge of reconciling their idealism with the complexities of reality. I don't think our good buddy Alec Knight goes that deep, but there still could be an argument there. The quest for justice, clearly. Don Quixote's quest is driven by a desire to right the wrongs he perceives in the world. Nightmare's mission also centers on justice as he takes on the role of a vigilante to combat the criminal elements that plague his city. Both characters are motivated by a sense of moral duty and a commitment to making their world a better place. You know, as far as the 90s go, this comic definitely has some things going for it. it, it it's definitely violent. It's action-packed. We've got the mob. We've got supernatural entities. We've got good old-fashioned honor and revenge. And we also have a decent ending to the story. You know, when you look at this, again... We got five issues and a zero issue, and the zero issue is essentially the resolution of Alec Knight saving his wife from Logan and leaving her and watching her from afar. I feel like this is a this is the beginning of Nightmare's days as a vigilante. All of this stuff that happened, it really feels like it happened within a span of like three days. When you see it from the point of view, like from Don Carbone, Don Carbone does the deal with the Eastern Europeans to acquire the nuclear warhead. And then shortly in the midst of that, he's stabbed by the Yakuza. Uh, he's in the hospital. He's recovering. He comes out of the hospital. He has his encounter with thrill kill. So we'll just say he spent like two or three days in the hospital. The thrill kill stuff goes down and that's the end of issue five, essentially. And we head into issue zero, which like I said, is our sixth issue. So I don't envision too much time has passed between Issue 5 and Issue 0, although really, who's to say? It could be years. But for me, it feels like it was shortly thereafter because maybe we could say months. Because Logan has now got a cybernetic arm. Probably took some time to get that put on there. Don Carbone, I don't believe, shows up in the Zero issue other than a flashback. So really, he doesn't have much of a part in that. Again, I could see this happening within a span of, of the first months of Nightmare's vigilante career it's a good tale of the start of a vigilante now i only have one other task after completing this podcast i'm going to write a blog post and get this on to the unspoken decade and again feel free to head over to the source material comics podcast youtube page and find the nightmare playlist listen and follow along you'll be able to kind of see what is unfolding in these books as i cover it all right that's it thanks for joining me I hope to do another project like this soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Unspoken Issues is part of the UnspokenDecade.com, the home for 90s comics, blogs, and podcasts. Unspoken Issues also has a Facebook group you can join if you are interested. Just search the Unspoken Issues podcast and request to join. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com and the Rattelich and Broadcasting Network, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon.